Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It's certainly good to be with you today, even though you are not physically here, you're not physically present, and you're at your homes. And just want you to know that wherever you are, we love you, and we want to continue to minister to you and to take care of you and to meet your needs. And, and we are the church. That, that's what we do. And next week, by the way, uh, for this Easter drive through that we are doing, this Easter drive through we're doing, we did reach out to the state and got permission from state officials to do this. Uh, we're practicing social distancing. Cars will be, um, our stations will be 50 feet apart, so it should be good. Uh, and as you know, though, sometimes plans change, and sometimes they change rather suddenly, especially this week. And I don't know about you, but I don't like it when plans change. And, and maybe you don't either. But when our plans change, it can be very frustrating. It can leave us feeling depressed. It can leave us feeling angry. I mean, our plans change. And when they do, especially when you don't want them to change, like it's not good. It's actually, we, we get just kind of bummed out. I remember several years ago when our plans, our, our plans changed rather drastically and, uh, See, I had this vision of, like you, uh, I want to be a good parent, and I wanted to take my kids to Disneyland. I think that's the one in Florida. But I wanted to take them to Disneyland. And when we were, uh, we were going there, like, it was the biggest vacation our family was ever going to take up until this point. Someone had given us free tickets, and we were so excited to go because it's super expensive to go there. And we had free tickets. We had a free place to stay at our friend's house, and it was going to be the best. I'm thinking, like, I'm going to be a rock star dad. Everybody's going to love me. You know, my kids be charming, like, dad, dad, you're the best, you know. And uh, in my head, like, this was really happening, and I'm thinking it's going to be fantastic, wonderful trip. Well, we get there and uh, just fast forward, we get to the Disney parking lot. We meant to get there right when they opened, you know, to get in right away. Well, apparently uh, everyone else has that same idea. So we had to wait in traffic just to get to Disney. Then when we got there, we had to wait in line just to find a parking spot. Then when we got a parking spot, we had to go to this tram station and wait in line for the tram to take us to the entrance where again, we had to wait in line. It took forever just to get in the front door of Disney. Now my kids are younger and they're, they're already impatient because like we've been building this up and they've always been thinking, oh, it's going to be so fun to go to Disney. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be wonderful. And uh, sure enough, uh, they start like fighting with each other and just like kids do, that's what they do. But it's hot. Imagine I'm sweating. It's hot. We've been standing in line. It's been almost two hours and we haven't even gotten to ride on a ride yet. And the kids are just kind of starting to have a meltdown. And I warn them like, look, I've had enough. Like you need to be good. You got to behave. And I'm not the only one. Like I'm looking around all these other parents. Their kids are also having meltdowns. But my kids were really struggling. And so I said, you know what? I've had enough. We're going to ride one ride and then we're going to go home. And by now, everyone's like, fine, you know, all in each other's throats. And we waited in line for one ride for an hour. And my kids, now they're going nuts. And I'm like, I just told you we're going home. Like it's done. And, and they're fighting and it's just not good. So we get on this ride and we ride the ride. And it was actually like probably the lamest ride at the entire park that we rode. And uh, afterwards they said, dad, uh, we promise we're going to be good. We promise we'll be good. And I relented and I said, okay. And I was dead serious that I was going to leave. But the whole day went, was dismal at best. In fact, here's a picture uh, that I forced my kids to take. And I said, you better smile because years from now, I'm going to show this picture at some point. And so I forced them to smile. And they had this kind of look like, yeah, we're smiling, but we're, we're, we're not happy to be here. In fact, this is miserable. In fact, that was the only time we've ever gone to Disney, uh, and uh, now it's over. No more Disney for us. Anyways, so uh, why do I say that? Because when our plans change, it, it, it affects us in these negative ways. And right now, plans have changed. Your plans have changed. You plan on having a great senior year. You plan on having a good sports year. You plan on going to uh, watch baseball this summer. Your plans ha have changed. Everything has changed. Everything in our world is changing, and it can be unsettling. Well, years ago, there was a group of people that had all of their plans changed. They all changed dramatically and suddenly, and they couldn't see what was going on at the time. They just couldn't see it. 
It was the week that Jesus came into Jerusalem. Jesus came into Jerusalem. And he had been ministering for three years. He had been doing this public ministry. He had been healing the sick. He had been uh, raising the dead. He had done all of these things. These, he had fed the hungry. Like his ministry had exploded in growth as he had traveled and as he had ministered all over the place. And as he had done that, he had this huge crowd following him. And all of Jesus' disciples, in fact, all of the people that were there on this day when he rode this colt, this donkey, into the city of Jerusalem, their plan was this. Their plan was that they were going to make Jesus king. That was their plan. They planned on making Jesus their king. They were aligned along the roads. They threw the palm branches. That's why it's Palm Sunday. They threw the palm branches on the road as he traveled on the, on the back of this colt. And they were all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were shouting they wanted him to be their earthly king. That was their plan. That was their plan. What we know from history, that their plans... And God's plans will radically different plans. Let's go to the scriptures. Scriptures say this. I'm, I'm going to pull it up right here in my notes that I have in front of me so I can remember. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Scripture says this. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with his colt b beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and they threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. At the time, the disciples' plan was this. The disciples' plan was for him to be king. And all of the people, because of all of the good things that Jesus had done, all of these miracles, they said, this is our king. He will be our king. They were so excited. But their plan and God's plan were different plans. They were thinking this be the end of the Romans. They'll be gone. They were thinking it was all be over. But Jesus, is, he knew why he actually came. He came because he was coming in. This is his last week alive in ministry. He came to die on the cross and subsequently to be risen from the dead. This was God's plan and God was in it. But their plans and God's plans were two different plans. Maybe right now your plans and God's plans are two different plans. You planned on playing sports, those plans faded. You planned on spending more time with friends, those plans faded. You planned on spending less time on social media, those plans have ended. Your plans and God's plans are different plans. And right now you can be left feeling depressed and discouraged and isolated and alone and wondering what is going on in our crazy world. As you watch the news, as I watch the news, as we see this stuff happening in real time, it can be scary. And you say, but I had plans. But I had plans. Well, our plans and God's plans are different plans. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? I'll say this. Is that if God brings you to it, God will get you through it. And right now, because God has brought this to us or allowed this to happen, I shouldn't say that God brought this to us, God has allowed this to happen because we live in a, a broken world. 
And we are waiting ultimately for our redemption when we get to be with our Lord and Savior. But we live in a world that's full of sickness and disease and hurt and pain and sorrow. And that's why we need a Savior. But if God has brought it to us, God will get us through it. God will get you through this. So I want to give you some encouraging words. If your plans and God's plans seem to be so such different plans right now, how do we align ourselves with that? How do we make sense of all of this? Well, first, pray. Pray. In times of confusion, in times of uh, when we're concerned, when we don't know what's going on, the best thing that you can do is pray. Now, I'm, I'm saying that. Don't just... Uh, you don't have to follow any liturgy. You don't have to be in any particular place to pray. All you have to do is pray. Be transparent with God. Be honest. Be open. Just say, Lord, I, I, I'm crying out to you. I'm going to trust you, God. I don't know what's going on right now. He, you know, my finances don't look good. My family situation is challenging. He, everything just seems messed up, but just be transparent with God. Oftentimes, I use the Lord's Prayer like as, a, as an outline when I pray. That's why God gave us the Lord's plan or the Lord's prayer so that we can use it. Uh, it's found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. But pray, but pray, pray. God will use this time and he will redeem it for his glory. I don't know how yet, but he will. I just look at the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest examples that we have of this. And he was under house arrest. He didn't want to be under house arrest. He had plans to do all of this ministry, but all of that fell apart. And he finds himself under house arrest. Maybe you feel like the same way right now in your place. Like, I just feel like I'm under house arrest. And Paul is thinking to himself, man, I don't, you know, I don't want to be here. I want to be somewhere else. But Paul used his time to write what are known as the prison epistles. Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians. And well under house arrest. Paul's plans had changed. So well under house arrest, he writes these words to the Philippian church that he was writing to from his place of imprisonment. He penned these words, don't worry about anything. Man, don't you wish you could say that right now? Don't you wish you could say that? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The number one thing that you need to do is pray. Right now you find yourself in the situation. You don't know where you're going to have any money. You don't know if you're going to have a job. You're wondering about food. Pray. Pray. Talk to God about it. God is not sleeping. He is not out fishing. He is not somewhere else. God is in the middle of the storm. In 1 John 5, 14, we read, and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. So we pray, we seek the will of God, and we pray. And by praying, you're connecting with God because he listens to you and he cares about you. God is very involved in your life and your situation. He knows what you need. Second, focus on who God is. Focus on who God is. Focus on who God is. Sometimes we get so focused on our own problems that we lose sight of who God really is. See, we get so focused, we, and when we get focused like this, we get narrow-minded because we can only see what's around us. But God always sees the bigger picture, and we focus on who God is. In Revelation 22, 13, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. This is God. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God is not surprised by this. He is not surprised at all. God is in this. Maybe you remember watching, it's a super old movie, but super popular, the movie The Wizard of Oz. I mean, I don't know who hasn't seen it, but... Um, I remember the Wizard of Oz and it was all about, you know, Dorothy and, and they follow the yellow brick road to the city of Oz and they, they want to go to this city to meet this, I think it's called the Emerald City. They want to go there to meet this great and powerful wizard who can get Dorothy back home to Kansas. 
That's why they went there. They follow this yellow brick road and they go all the way there and they show up in front of the great Wizard of Oz and all this smoke and noise and all of this stuff, mouths and everything are opening and they look behind the curtain and it turns out that the Wizard of Oz is not this great and powerful being. It's just a very awkward looking man, short in stature, very insecure, pulling all of these levers to make it look like he knew exactly what he was doing, that he was all great and powerful. God is not like that. God is not like that. God is not a fake. God is not a phony. God is the one who can move mountains. He's the mountain mover. That song of ascent that we sung, our, our last worship song, just, I will praise you on the mountains. I will praise you when the mountain is in my way. God can move mountains. He can get you through this situation. He is with you now, even though your plans may have crumbled. Everything in your world may have been rocked, but God is still in this. And we need to focus on who God is, the great and awesome and amazing God, our Lord and Savior. Psalm 31, 24, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Because God is present in this. God is with us. If God brings you to it, God will get you through it. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I had this sentence this week that I, that I wrote down. The greater the crisis, the greater Christ is. The greater the crisis, the greater Christ is. So that means that whenever we have a crisis, Christ is even greater than our crisis. And we can focus on Christ. And when we focus on Christ, it makes our crisis seem very small. When our crisis seems too big, that's because we're looking at it too much. You need to take your eyes off the crisis and put your eyes on Christ. Because Christ will get you through this. And third, believe that God will meet your needs. Believe that God will meet your needs. So, if God brings you to it, he will get you through it. How? We pray. We focus on who God is. And we believe that God will meet your needs. Believe that God will meet your needs. Luke 11, 9 through 13 says this. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So keep asking, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. Right now you might feel destitute. Like many people, I've been watching all these interviews on different news stations and people are feeling destitute, they're feeling hopeless. I just want to encourage you as a Christian, as a believer, to focus on God and trust that God will meet your needs. He will. He will. He'll meet your needs. He always does. You're living proof of that. The very fact that you are here now is living proof that God will meet your needs. He's met them in the past and he will meet them now. Oftentimes God always meets our needs with a third option. There's always this third option. Just think about it. Jesus' disciples they were so excited. They thought Jesus was going to become their earthly king. Jesus had, did not have that in mind. That was their plan. But God's plan and their plan were two different plans. God's plan was to send Jesus to die for the sins of the world on the cross and to be risen from the dead to prove once and for all that God is bigger than any crisis, even death. But their plans crumbled. In fact, after their plans blew up, and they watched Christ that week. It went from this great start to Good Friday. And Good Friday is the day that Jesus was crucified. And we call it Good Friday because we look at it through the lens of history. And we see that God came and did this very intentionally. But their plans crumbled. The Pharisees and the Romans, their plans also crumbled when you think about it. Because their plan was to kill Jesus. Their plan was to squelch this movement. Their plan was to stop 
everything that was going on and get back to business as usual. And their plans were rocked as well when Jesus was risen from the dead. See, their plans and God's plans were two different plans. Oftentimes there's this third option. There's this third option that we can't see, but God can see it. And it takes eyes of faith to believe that God has a third option in store. Give an example. Several years ago, we had, uh, my wife and I had decided we were going to move because the developer bought our other house. We we're going to move to our, our new house. And uh, I use point this way and this way because where I'm standing right now, my old house was that way and my new house is this way. But uh, our plans were this. We we're going to sell our house. We bought this other place, some land that we we're going to uh, move a house to and it was all going to work out seamlessly. Well, that was... Uh, in like 2005, 2006, and then the housing market grenaded. Our developer backed out. Our other house, the renter said he wanted, or the guy who sold it to us said, well, he didn't have any place to go either, so he was going to stay. And I moved my entire family into the upstairs uh, of a rented split-level house. And the person lived in the basement. We lived on top. My three kids, my two dogs, uh, my wife and I, they're all young. And uh, that was not our plan. Our plans had crumbled. And I thought to myself, how am I going to pay for these two mortgages? But we wound up renting out the other house. We wound up renting out uh, the house that we were, had just bought that was a teardown house. And we moved to this other place. It was a third option that we couldn't see. Then Kathy and I had bid on a house uh, to be moved. It was a Rambler built in the 70s. This Rambler that was built in the 70s. And and this house was supposed to be moved, uh, and it was all going to be seamless. Well, that didn't work out either. And we were wondering, why can't we move this house? Like, why can't we get it done? The movers kept stalling and stalling and stalling and stalling. And then uh, another house came up for bid. A friend of mine mentioned to me, hey, the city has to deal with this house, and uh, they don't know what to do with it. So we bid on another house, and it's the house that we currently live in. I bid on it. Uh, I got the whole house for $5,500. We just had to move it. This was, a, and, and do hardly anything to it. It's a gorgeous house that we got for so cheap. Moving it was highly expensive, mind you, but buying the actual house was very cheap. See, that was a third option that we couldn't see, but God knew it. God knew it. God knew what was coming. We couldn't see it. To me, all of my plans had fallen apart, but God knew what was coming. There was a third option that we simply couldn't see. Right now in your situation, I don't know what your situation is, but there is a third option. Maybe you don't know what it is yet. You can't see it yet, but God knows. Put your faith and trust in him. Like on Palm Sunday, the disciples had plans. They crumbled. The Pharisees and Romans had plans and they crumbled, but God had a better plan, a bigger plan. And God's plan was for Jesus Christ to die on the cross, be risen from the dead, to be the savior of the world. And the world has never been the same. The world has never been the same. That moment moved everything. That moment moved everything. It was God's plan from the beginning. But at the time, nobody could see it. Right now, your plans may have crumbled, but God is still in them. And I really believe that God has a third option for you. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the option is for me. But I do believe absolutely with the eyes of faith that God is in this and that God still has plans for you because God always provides a third option. Always, always, always. I want to encourage you to trust God. To trust God. Several years ago, in fact, it was a long time ago, um, and I've told this story before, but, but it's so powerful in my life, I, I keep actually going back to it. And, and it's this, is that years ago when Josh, my son, was, he's healthy and doing great now, but when he was three and a half years old, he was diagnosed with leukemia, and our whole world was shattered because we had plans. We had plans, and those plans fell apart. And my plans changed radically, and like, uh, Kathy's plans changed and Sarah's and Katie's and they're all, like everybody's, my parents and my in-law, like everyone's plans around us changed because of this situation and we didn't like it. It crumbled, it fell apart. And we learned to depend on God through thick and thin. 
And that was some of the greatest spiritual times in my life when I was so dependent on God for our situation. I just had to trust him in everything. And I said, God, when this is over, it's either going to break me or it's going to build me up. And I was very transparent with God because I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know how it would end. We had been warned, uh, this is going to be hard on your marriage. This is going to be hard on your family. This is going to be hard on you. We were warned, and they were all right. It was so hard on everyone. But I said, God, this is either going to break me or it's going to build me up. And I watched through that crisis. My whole family was built up and strengthened. And as we looked at Christ, we said, God, it came to us, but you got us through it. And I did something at the end of that that I'm not advocating for you to do at all, but I got this tattoo of Philippians 4.13 that says, never give up and a shield. Again, parents, I'm not advocating uh, for tattoos. This is a personal choice that I made. But it says, never give up, Philippians 4.13. Why? Because I needed to be reminded to put my shield of faith on, to never give up, and to trust God. Christ in all things. Philippians 4.13 says this, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Maybe you need to see, say that out loud yourself right now. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I fully believe that. I fully believe right now that God will get you through this. Your plans may have crumbled, but God's plans will still prevail. Because God is in this. The God of the universe, the God who created all things, loves you, and he will never, ever, ever let you go. So this Palm Sunday, I challenge you to trust Christ with your crisis. Trust Christ with your crisis. He will get you through this. Let me pray. I'll end, and then we'll have a Q&A time. Gracious God, we thank you this day that we can come before you. Wherever we are, in our homes, uh, outside, I don't know, wherever we're at, God, we come before you as the church. As the church, as your people, we love you. We give you all praise and all glory. And right now, God, in our crisis, we lift up the name of Jesus and we give you all praise and all glory. Even though our plans may have crumbled, God, your plans will still prevail. And we confess right now our trust in you. God, we thank you for your goodness. And right now, for those who want to receive you as their Lord and Savior, someone needs to trust you for the first time. May my words in my, that I say in my mouth be just echoed in this person's heart. Dear Jesus, right now I invite you into my heart and into my life. And I invite you to be the, uh, my Savior. I want to have a relationship with you. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. And I thank you, God, for loving me just as I am. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you just gave your life to Christ, I certainly want to encourage you to let us know. Send us an email. Uh, connect with us on Facebook. And uh, we would love to connect with you. But you have hope. Christ is in this crisis. He is in your crisis. And because, uh, well, I'm done preaching. I don't want to go on another message. So God bless you. Uh, we'll catch you later.